Hey everyone, welcome back to Electoral Dysfunction, the show where comedians and experts debate the news of the week from the safety of their quarantine. I'm your host, Tom Brennan. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, on the show today, we've got a packed show. Some of our favorite guests are back. We're going to be talking about the situation in Portland, uh, the, the ongoing COVID numbers that we're seeing across the South and Southwest, particularly in Georgia. Of course, the sad news that came out late Friday night, the passing of Congressman and icon John Lewis. Uh, so what a show and what a week, I'll tell you. I cannot imagine. Extra, extra, read all about it. Extra, extra, read all about it. Well, we got me, news. this is great. Oh, after a tough week, it's great to see a, a, a familiar, friendly face. Fan favorite newsboy, Phil, a 1920s newsboy, cursed to walk amongst the world until eternity. Phil, it was a bad loaf of bread I grabbed. I would have liked to have died before now. Read all about it. <laughs> that loaf of bread kept you alive? It was cursed, huh? It was cursed by Mayor LaGuardia's ma. You know, <laughs> that Italian black magic they got. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, <laughs> we're going to get letters. It's uh, the last time I snoop around Gracie Mansion. <laughs> oh, man, not a place to snoop. Take it from me. Phil, how are you? How's, how's the, what's the word on the street? Seems packed out there. Oh, uh, yeah, the ship's on fire and all the rats are at war for lack of resources. <laughs> we got over 85 babies test positive for COVID-19, the Titanic of epidemics, if polio were Star Wars. Adjusted for inflation, though, it's still Spanish flu, but give it time and that standing will be gone with the wind. Just <laughs> like the movie, read all about it. Oh, oh man, delightful. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're really it's a good. long, hot summer, and ain't nobody here is doing the right thing. My goodness. Well, you sure boiled that tragedy down to some really, uh, I'm gonna, here's what I liked about it. Were they, were they cheap jokes? Yes. Were they easy ones? No. Nice work. There were a lot of them in one. That's right. <laughs> it was Quantity five. over quality, Tom. That's how we've been selling the news for ages. Five twos equals a ten, as George Carlin famously said. Uh, <laughs> So what else is going on out there in the world, Phil? Tell, sell some papers to the audience. The Portland mayor is up in arms over secret police, which reminds me of Mayor LaGuardia's gotcha wagon back in the day. Poor, what is it good for? Manual labor and imprisonment, huh? <laughs> anyway, John Lewis passed away, aged 80. He That's espoused right. the term good trouble, or as I like to call, flicking the newspaper just a little hotter at Wall Street bros. Very nice. Oh, man. I was worried when you brought up John Lewis, but you landed it in a great place. No, oh, I, 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 I got a special place in my heart for him. A man that can retain that much youth for 100 years, or at least 80, has, uh, I, 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 have, uh, I have respect for. At least he got to die. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, man. That's a joke that would make Mayor LaGuardia proud. Well done. <laughs> it would. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'd just like to try something. I just want to try something on. Please. Law and order. Nothing. Nothing. It just seems desperate. It yeah. just seems desperate. It Hold does. on. I'm going to try another one. All right. Arrest the cops who killed Breonna Taylor. Ah, uh, that seems more better. Right. It yeah. certainly seems more correct, but unfortunately seems uh, like, like the similar result, unfortunately. Yep. Yep, uh, mostly just impotent rage, but by an <laughs> impotent man versus an impotent majority. That's right. Wow, that's, man, you may have just coined the episode title of this. <laughs> an impotent man versus the impotent majority. Very nice. Yes, electoral dysfunction. It's on brand. <laughs> uh, so, in other news, Pat <laughs> Robertson believes cocaine and marijuana are vegetables. He believes we should be above vegetables. If smoking joints was eating vegetables, newsboy Phil would be a monument of fitness. <laughs> I don't eat too much cocaine, but if I did, I'd be a 24-hour news cycle. <laughs> uh, New York is back to normal, save for the fireworks. I've been tracking the progress from my mobile cardboard bunker version 3, the last one where it's rained on, and the first one was a box full of fireworks. Tom. Yes, Phil. <laughs> you won't believe what I found. I won't, but- It was rats. Try me. You've... The fireworks. It was rats. <laughs> rats are at war right now. 
They've right. been signaling for war between their people. Resources are scarce in quarantine. And they have resorted to sleeping inside engine blocks and cannibalism. Yep. Ah, we are yes. not so far removed from these people. Not at all. There's only time until they unleash the secret rat kings to dispatch to their own kind. That's right. If I recall correctly, the Rat King was a, uh, was a Ninja Turtles villain. So, uh, that's, yes. that's fun. In reality, a Rat King is a hundred rats tied together by a single tail. <laughs> Which, when you think about it, would have been a much more scary thing for the Ninja Turtles to fight than just some guy who, who talked to rats. Oh, yes, that's an old time, that's what I like to call old-timey Facebook brigading. Right. <laughs> get, a, get a bunch of men who have pictures of women or soldiers as mm -hmm. their profile picture tie them up and suddenly you've got a right-wing facebook group yeah yeah it's a long hot summer Jeez. it's gonna be it's a long point. it already is a long hot summer and unfortunately we still have a month and a half to go newsboy phil it's always a pleasure to see you and i'm so glad to have you here uh what got got any last stories to tell us about before before we move on i got nothing tom i just <laughs> look forward to the secret police coming for me Perhaps then, my right-winged family will wonder where I am. Read all about it. <laughs> Newsboy Phil, uh, always a pleasure to see him. Uh, one, of our, one of our best friends and, uh, here at Electoral Dysfunction, and a tragic story uh, that will never actually have an ending. Ned Thorne, star wipe us to the panel. And join me in welcoming this week's panel. First up, we're really excited to have her back on the show. Uh, her feminist horror film, Three Days, is currently uh, streaming on Spam Flix and Flix End later this month on Alta. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, Julie Charbet. Hey, Julie, how are you? Oh, I'm so good. So good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. It is good to see you as well. Uh, I love saying this person's resume because I feel like I'm describing a G.I. Joe character. Uh, she is a from the old school sketch comedy community, also a deacon and veteran of the Air National Guard here uh, upcoming on the podcast Crossroads. Hannah Bell. Hey, Hannah, how are you? Hey, I'm well today. Thanks for having me, Tom. Excellent. I'm glad you're well today. Uh, very excited to have this gentleman on here, the kindest blue check mark of them all. No offense, Robert George, uh, and a columnist for the Chicago Tribune. Please welcome to the show Rex Upke. Hey, Rex, how are you? Hey, good to see you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to do this. Thank Whatever you. this is, yeah. we'll find out. It's <laughs> oof. I hope you have opinions and are willing to share them on the internet. Oh, <laughs> this yeah. is the place for you. Every uh, day. And finally, editorial columnist for the New York Daily News, my buddy, my pal, my lifelong chum, Robert George. Robert, how are you? I'm doing, I, I was doing okay until you, you said that I was like only like the second nicest blue check person. I didn't that. say you were the second nicest. Oh, 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 okay. So, yeah, okay, so I'm kind of bummed now. Wow. Uh, that goes to Axel Alonzo. Anyway, that's a joke for <laughs> Robert George and nobody else. Uh, <laughs> hey, Axel, I hope you're well. Uh, so, I'm doing great, thank you, Tom. Uh, I what? Hope what? Well. I hope you're doing well as well. well I'm glad to. Uh, this is we're, we're, this is a, a difficult week for America. Um, we have seen COVID rates continuing to rise at you know uh, out in the south and the southwest. Uh, we could be on track for seven thousand. Uh, I think it was um, somewhere in the realm of uh, ten, we could be on track for ten thousand cases a day uh, for you and me, according to the CDC. Uh, record numbers, particularly in Georgia and Texas, uh, and good news. The president of the United States, who as of this recording is Donald John Trump, uh, has responded by sending uh, uh, un unmarked uh, secret police into the city of Portland, Oregon. That has been his, his response to the crisis at hand. Uh, so let's talk about, we'll talk about COVID in a minute, but I want to talk about Oregon because I think this is, this is a story that only later in the week has started to get more traction and coverage, which is to say uh, we have... Uh, unmarked, unmar uh, unmarked uh, uh, federal troops. You know, they many of them just have the word police on their uniforms. Uh, we later discover in the week are from the Department of Homeland Security, who are on the streets of Portland. They've been uh, uh, arresting people at protests. Most notably, last weekend there was some conflict between them and some protesters. They used non-lethal rounds, but in the process, still critically injured uh, a few folks. There's one gentleman who. Uh, had to have facial reconstruction surgery, still has a tube in his skull because he was shot at close range by this non-lethal weapon. Uh, video footage has been popping up on the internet of, of people just being sort of arrested by these people who have no ID, 
uh, put in the back of unmarked vans, taken away. And this is all, you know, last night, uh, Friday night, uh, the governor of Oregon, Kate Brown, specified that this has been, you know, an unrequested support from the federal government, from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and the mayor of Portland, likewise, uh, echoing that this has not been requested and, in fact, argued that the city government had seen particularly strong protests, and these are protests in response to the, the death of George Floyd. Uh, they'd seen particularly strong protests, but had felt that up until last week and the weekend of, of the 15th, that they were starting to see them subside a little bit. And they really believed that that weekend, in fact, could have been the last weekend of protests. And then this federal insurgency happened. So people are, are referring to this as an American city under federal, under federal control, you know, under military occu occupancy. Uh, why now? Why, why is Donald Trump uh, sending these troops into Portland? And, and is this a harbinger? You know, you think we're all talking now Three of us on this call are from New York, one from Chicago, one from Los Angeles. Is this a thing that we think we could see of in more American cities? Well, quite, quite possibly, Tom. And in fact, um, one name that you left out, uh, kind, of, kind of important person you left out in terms of those who criticized this, uh, was the U.S. attorney for, for, for Oregon. I think it's Paul Williams. I'm hoping that I got that right. If not, I will correct it before the segment's over. Uh, but he's a, a, he, he uh, is a Republican uh, US, a U.S. attorney, and he said that uh, he wanted to know exactly, you know, from what authority that the, the DHS was doing this. He thought it was, uh, it was a constitutionally fraught action and so you've got you, you've got really what could be considered bipartisan criticism um, of what's going on here. Um, but I want to take a I want to take a step back about why uh, another area where this is really um, problematic. Uh, this was apparently signed off on by uh, Chad Wolf, acting that, acting uh, director of uh, Homeland Security, or acting. Yeah, well, well, first of all, you've got the, you, you've got in, in, in a in a world of Karens, you've got a, you've got a Chad. <laughs> running DHS, which I think is, which is, which is kind of interesting. But, yeah. uh, but, but you, but you got- but you, Chad you, still you, rule. You, you, um, <laughs> well, you know, and this is like, this is like the 20th anniversary of the, you know, the Chad uprising in Florida after the election. So, so there it's- Oh, so, man. There you yeah. go. Uh, uh, but, but, that but, pun no, but, brought to you for free from the Daily News. Uh, but, but Tom, uh, and, Yes, my hard it's lemonade. Hard lemonade. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, but but seriously, uh, uh, Chad is the, he's the acting he's the acting um, uh, secretary head, head of DHS. Uh, DHS has had has had an acting head for about a I think for about a year now, um, maybe maybe longer. Um, the the next two or three individuals underneath underneath him. Which are supposed to be Senate approved are also uh, are, are also uh, acting members. So you've got it, you've got a, a very important uh, federal agency that has no Senate co um, co confirmed um, uh, individuals uh, at the uh, at, at the top, and they're making um, they're making decisions um, which, uh, to use the, uh, the the language of the U.S of the Republican U.S. Attorney in Oregon, you know, are constitutionally fraught. So, yeah, I think, I, I think we should be very worried. Yeah, this is very worrisome. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's, a, it's the federal government acting on using its power against a, a private state citizens and for, for what, reason like especially with trump's stance on covid like he can't pretend that that's the reason why he's doing this because he doesn't believe it's a problem um and the first thing that pops into my mind is like when uh midway through shelter in place when different people were protesting throughout the the plains in the midwest when they were tired of quarantining did this happen to them absolutely and utterly not so it's just like it's it's the trump move of create more chaos but it's just like once you start moving in this way there's no there's no going back and i think particularly jumping off that when you think about those protests that happened in the midwest 
imagine you're on the streets of an American city, you're in Portland, Oregon, you're walking down the street and some guys in military gear come up and say, get in the car. They don't have IDs. They don't have badges. You know, say what you want about big city police departments and how the car, the the minivans. Yeah. (laughs) Say what you want about how police, uh, how police departments handle the protests. Like they still had badges and numbers visible and cars, you know, cars that had numbers visible. You knew where people knew you were going to a, you know, New York or Chicago or LA police station. Uh, Imagine someone comes up to you and for all you know, they could just be, some rando in military uniform that says get in this car uh, because I'm mad at you. Like that's the thing that I thought watching some of this footage. Well, and these, these folks too, they're, um, I mean, it's, it does seem that they are CPB, right? They're uh, customs and patrol. Yeah. Uh, They're not national guard. They're not anybody else. You know, there's, there's no um, sort of more regulated tracking system for where these, these employees are coming from. And, yeah, that's, uh, I, it, it, it's also, I, I just find it so eerie. It, everybody, you know, I think a lot of folks find this very eerie how this cropped up so unassumingly, like it just sort of started happening out of smoke. And Portland, I guess, has been protesting for, for 50 days straight, but, and that's a little different than what's happening in New York and LA, where it's a little more staggered, like it's still protesting going on, but it's a little more like, uh, not inconsistent in it just chronologically inconsistent but um yeah no it's incredibly eerie although I did look up customs and border patrol and I was very sad to hear that they have a division of horse patrol which in other circumstances sounds like a dream job right yeah <laughs> it's also famous border city Portland Oregon <laughs> right <laughs> right, yeah. right people yeah. for the, uh, for, to get the, the voodoo donuts and whatnot but yeah, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know I think that I don't think it's a I try to, you know, the weirdest thing about the Trump era for me is that I've spent a, a large part of my career actively making fun of conspiracy theorists uh, mm-hmm. on the right. And I, yet here I am and slowly devolving into like, a, you know, borderline conspiracy theorist on the left, but whatever, we'll set that aside. I, I, I do actually think that Portland was probably intentional because stuff could happen there and it wouldn't pick up the the brunt of the, of the mainstream press in the Northeast was not going to get it right away yeah you know, it took a, and it did it took a while for that to kind of filter you know you saw people on twitter and stuff sort of saying hey what's happening here oh people pay attention to this and it took maybe three four days uh before it started to kind of hit more like the mainstream so it almost seems a little bit you know like a test run thing that they're trying to do which i mean you know looking at the trump administration that is utterly believable they've tried to push the envelope on virtually every you know quasi authoritarian thing they can and so you know, the, the other, this, this, to me, this, this lines up with the campaign messaging, which has now basically become uh, terror in the streets. You're not safe. Uh, law and order, as he keeps randomly tweeting as he's, you know, letting people out of prison. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I think that, you know, I think that this is, uh, you know, sort of a test run for a way to start coming to Chicago, coming to, you know, LA or New York or other large metropolitan areas and trying to make things seem worse than they are and trying to create this sort of standoff and, and this scary, you know, uh, you know, just situation, which is obviously going to exacerbate any problems that already exist. As in Portland, like you said, I mean, things are probably calming down a bit and now everybody justifiably is outraged and, and should be, I mean we have to stand up to this you can't just let it go and just, this. there was yeah. there were there were they were hinting that they were go- going to do something like this uh, a few weeks ago when when uh, when Seattle and the, the chop area and so forth was, right. was, really, was really big and then Seattle managed to uh, calm things calm things down and break it up break it up themselves even though Trump at some point said he said uh, well, I, I told the uh, uh, I told the mayor of Seattle to get that that place cleaned up, or otherwise I'm going to send the tro- uh, send the troops in. And uh, the mayor said uh, he never said that. I don't know what he's I don't know what he's I don't, I don't know what he's I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, but right, so you know, you're right. I, but by by using by doing by doing Portland, which is kind of you know, uh, no offense to Portland, but like kind of the second-rate Seattle in certain ways. 
So in fairness, in fairness, Whoa. hey, shakes. Oh Ooh. man. In fairness, in fairness, they did have a really, they did have a really good, uh, they did have a really good um, uh, sitcom. Um, more, more than more than Seattle. But then again, Frazier was in Seattle. So I'm going to be bringing this up to to second, uh, to third funniest blue check mark on Twitter. I'm going to bring this up to Kelly Sue DeConnick. Portland Zone, <laughs> any John very friendly. Them. There we go. There, there, there we, there we go. I, well, I apologize. I apologize. I apologize to Kelly Sue. But yeah, it, obviously they were, they, they were, they were testing. They were, te they were testing this out, and apparently they are using uh, some uh, a rel some uh, an obscure um, federal law um, about uh, what kind of protection you can bring to federal buildings, and they're 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 saying that. Um, the protests were uh, were attacking um, the, the the federal court the, the federal courthouse in yeah. in Portland, and so um, the, the pretext the pretext they have for this is um, is going against anybody that's you know wearing dark clothes as some member of Antifa that might have been involved in um, attacking attacking the federal courthouse. That's the pretext they're they're using. I think that's and like might have been is a big thing because I think uh, these stories coming out of Portland, uh, in many cases, people who arrested were told like it was either vandalism or assault, <laughs> which are two fairly different crimes. <laughs> and normally, you know, you don't send troops in for vandalism. Um, and Rex, I think that's also a really good point just about Portland and the media market of it all because you think back to the action that was taken in Washington, D.C. that re received some really universal immediate condemnation. And a big part of that is because the media is right there in Washington watching all of this happen. Uh, and they were able to go to senators right away and say, are you OK with the fact that uh, <laughs> that that federal people, federal troops just tear gas Lafayette Park? And, you know, no, no senators one's okay were that. able to sneak into elevators. And yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Mitt Romney can I ignore the hell out of Portland. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, though, I like you know, it's so it's so hard to find optimism and silver linings and things. But if there is some to find, I, you know, general generals and military personnel condemned the actions in D.C. Like, and generals and military personnel are not involved in what's happening in Portland. So I think that there is like once it's brought to light, and the fact that the people doing it are sort of a ragtag bunch of like uh, super. Yeah. <laughs> shadow creeps like right. you know i don't know if you can enlist a <laughs> whole army of those people to though to go attack like la or new york or chicago but actually julie the 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 um the slightly pessimistic um take on how you just how you describe that is yeah. that um is that maybe they're learning the wrong lesson um the, the, there's a lot of polling out there that shows that there was a major um uh polling inflection point in the, the Lafayette attack, Lafayette Park attack, um, mm -hmm. the, the idea of uh, of the, of the federal government tear gassing peaceful protesters, oh by the way, including lots and lots of white people, uh, really turned a, a large segment of the of the pop populace, oh by the way, including lots of white people, up, off. And since that point. Uh, I won't. I won't say Trump's numbers have been in free fall, but they have been. They've. They've been. They've been. They've been. They've been sliding down. So the the lesson being learned there is, you can't do this in the middle of the day, uh, in the middle of a in the middle of a federal park in Washington, where, to use an old phrase, the whole world is watching. So let's test this. At, let's just test this out in the Great Northwest, um, in, in the in, in the in the dark. It's three hours behind. Um, it's three. It's three hours behind um, uh, East East Coast time, um, where where most of the media where most of the media is. And let's see. And let's see what we can get away with. That, that's. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I, I guess I'm just saying that like the personnel, the lack of like official personnel is the thing that gives me a little bit of a little bit of hope that this is not going to be a surge of something scarier. But but again, I mean, the, the, again, the flip side is that the lack of. The, if if you don't have somebody like uh, you know the joint chief Monitoring. of staff, well no the joint chief of yeah. staff the head of the joint chief of staff um, 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 Millie he had to come out and apologize for his role in that now you've got all these people who are behind the scenes you don't know and so nobody's going to apologize because you have no idea who's in in, in control yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. oh yeah no I was just I'm thinking uh, with my my veteran cap on and people can use their uh, First Amendment right to speak out against it 
But when it comes down to it, if an order is made by the commander in chief, like that's, that's a real leadership pickle uh, that the joint chiefs would be in if it was between following the orders of, um, of a president or doing something uh, unconstitutionally unsound. Because when you take those oaths, you're, you're swearing to protect and defend the constitution of the United States of America against enemies, foreign and domestic. So if, if Trump was to, like, if he's testing it with the secret arm to maybe apply American force later, like, ugh, that's a downer for me. Yeah, I mean that 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 that, that, that rather nefarious phrase, foreign and domestic. You know, that's 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 it's it's uh, it's problematic, squishy, very squishy. Uh, it's also not lost on me. You're talking about the city of Portland. I wonder if part of this place. It's a city that looks a little more suburban than the average city. It's 59% white. I do wonder if there's also a hope of like the optic of you know, the optic to the white suburban voters of, oh, look, it could be coming to your neighborhood and we're sending these troops in to stop it. It's one thing you send the troops into the big mean cities that, you know, suburban voters don't care about. But if it's a more suburban looking city, you know, that might have resonance, but it could have resonance either way. Uh, dark, terrible times, as always, <laughs> <laughs> living under Trump. But I was thinking about this today, like Donald Trump, I don't think is a very good president. I. <laughs> Uh, throughout, but Top I also think like, which one? Oh, that top. Your ex. <laughs> editorial columnists agree with me. <laughs> Going out on a limb. Tom Brennan goes out on a limb. Um, they but, could have done better, possibly. But I, don't well, I, I think like because what's what's interesting. He's not even a bad. He's not even good at being a bad president right. because when you think about like we've seen tendencies from him towards fascism and, 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 and that sort of strongman uh, government. And yet, like, when you think about the moment we're living in, if ever an opportunity arose for him to seize power the way he wanted to in a way that people might have supported, it's the COVID-19 pandemic, you know? Like, people are quick to give government power in moments of crisis, you know, like, and like, I can think, I think mass mandates should happen. I imagine, like, I could see an autocrat being like, hmm, if I can mandate a mask, what else can I mandate? Uh, and yet, you know, it's, and yet, you know, his, his, his move for more power is towards an issue like, you know, is, is, is more towards these issues rather than the, the sort of unifying issue that everyone in the country is kind of, is, is, is freaking out about, which is, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that's what they call a not very smooth transition. Uh, but let's talk about uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, which here in the, in the great city of New York, we last weekend had our first 24 hour period since uh, March with no deaths. Uh, but you know, that is, that's optimistic, but we're still, you know, even our, our phase four of reopening is a very, me starts on Monday, but is a very measured phase four. We're still, you know, we're still by no means out of the woods. Uh, state of California is starting to have, uh, shutdowns again, uh, this week, uh, this week, Georgia saw some strong record numbers, but at the same time, governor Kemp of Georgia, uh, made it against the rules, uh, you know, would not allow cities to mandate mandatory masks. So the mayor of Atlanta has, uh, you know, they're going to court over this. Uh, the CDC this week has said that like, if ever, if there were mask mandates everywhere, like we could be in a much better position within, I think it was four to eight weeks. Uh, w w w even uh, why? <laughs> you think about this. Donald Trump wore a mask last week, and even this week, Trump, while being like, ah, oh, mask mandates, who needs them? But I'm for masks in that interview with Chris Wallace, I believe this week on Fox News. Uh, why now? Why now would you suddenly, with upticks in, in, of numbers in Georgia, or would, you, would you immediately move to shut down any mask mandates if we're starting to see that masks work? I'm curious. Because Brian Kemp just hates all the great press that Ron DeSantis in Florida is getting. <laughs> He's jealous. <laughs> yep. I mean, wait a minute. No, wait. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, you, you, you somehow managed to steal the uh, Republican National Committee away from, you know, uh, when North Carolina didn't want it, you stole it away from Georgia. And so I've got to show how, um, you know, how much more down, you know, down with the cause that, that, that I am. I, I, 
This one that's my ex good. that's my expert observation, by the way, Tom. That's Take good work. work. That's that's woof. That's years on Capitol Hill right there. <laughs> uh, this one's a real head scratcher, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that's so much fun here. It's a real head scratcher. The masks help. It's not it's somehow because of how Americans maybe consume media and some people get their information strictly based from Fox News and other people are like, so, you know, I feel like what the pandemic did is it blew up the, that, that thing where people are, I get my news from over here and I'm right. No, I get my news from over here and I'm right. right. So it's just like somehow it became more of a, a left thing to, to comply and to wear masks when this virus doesn't care what, how you vote or anything about you other than you could be a host. Um, so it's just like, just wear the mask. None of us actually want to or like it. P.S. Uh, I wear my mask all the time and um, I hate it, but I do it because I love my neighbors. <laughs> I hate my neighbors, but I actually really like my mask. So <laughs> I'm using it them all the time. Yeah, I, it's, the easy, it's the easiest thing. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it's really it, it's staggering. I, you know, in some ways, I feel like the whole Trump era here has been kind of a national IQ test that has, we've failed miserably. But, but if that wasn't the national IQ test, this is okay. This is simple, and I think you're right. Media literacy is a huge problem here, and 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 the the sort of, you know, uh, everybody just drinking from whatever spigot they prefer in terms of news is another. You know, that's a huge part of the problem. But at the end of the day, it isn't hard to figure out the truth here, okay? I mean, it does not take much to get the actual information that says that if you wear a mask, you're protecting yourself, you're protecting others. And also to connect the reasoning of like, well, hey, I don't have it, so I'm safe. Or, you know, like, no, that's not how it works, dummy. It works differently. You know, like there's a lot. Of it. And so I just think that, you know, I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm, I'm almost sick of trying to like be gentle and massage it. And it's just that people are really, really dumb. And this is really dumb and selfish. And that's what's happened is that we've kind of nurtured a culture of like anti-science uh, and, and just this sort of like stubborn defiance is how you define being American. And, and, and I think that that is just, this is the worst thing that could have happened during a time when that attitude is so prevalent. And, and so you have people just flaunting this and acting like, you know they're invincible and if they're not invincible they don't care and if others get sick they don't care and all you know and it's just it's amazing to watch i mean um, we, sorry no, 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 sorry i'll just say this I, to tamp down a little bit on the cultural wars i will uh make the observation you know as somebody living in new york that um while our numbers overall have been very have been very good um there is some there's some data points showing that there's been, you know, there's a rise in, you know, in positive cases among the 20, 20 to 20, 20, 20 to 29 year old um, group. And there have been, you know, these anecdotal, um, uh, these anecdotal episodes of supposed, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the young, sexy partying crowd having these maskless, you know, these maskless parties and, I, 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 well, the thing is, yeah. it, it, it's the fact. The fact, though, that the numbers are going up in the 20, 29 year old group might, whether it's exactly that's what's going on. I mean, we don't, um, we we don't know. There is, and we, but we have seen other stories, not just stories. We've actually just seen seen the pictures of uh, folks, you know, uh, drinking outside of bars uh, in the Upper East Side, uh, Lower East, um, Lower East Side. And, uh, and some and some some other places. So um, and, and w again, without with, with, without masks. So while there is a, a something something of a a cultural um, resistance um, on masks um, down the south, it's not like it's not just saying that there aren't certain you know generational you know hey what the hell I'm you know I'm young. Uh, and in fact, the, the case numbers across the country, whether you. Well, whether California, which had been pretty kind of strong on on on, on lockdown, versus uh, Atlanta and Florida, which had always had been kind of you know devil may care, um, the, the 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 increases have been coming in the in the in the younger in the younger generation. 
So it's, it's yes, there, yes, there's in red states is a, a resistance on masks and stuff like that. But what's going on in general is not just only, it's not purely red and blue. And I didn't. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with Hannah and Rex. I'm 100% on board. And but but yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, besides, like, we have this like, cowboy culture individualism of American spirit. Uh, we also have like, you know, kids like a uh, youth with all of these movements and the protests, youth voter registration is not up. Like, that's a thing that kids have an obligation to contribute to their society too and they're not doing that either you know there are things that like it seems it seems inherently just like part of your commitment to your community to do things that benefit everyone but that's like that's not a given for a lot of people and a lot of young people too um and also like beyond that just sort of this the spirit of like individualism there's also I, I've been thinking a lot in this pandemic about uh, disruptors, like, um, you know, uh, uh, non-tubed toothpaste and shampoo, things that are disruptors in the marketplace are things that Americans use every day. And so you figure out what that is, you come in and you create a new model for that thing. So I've been thinking about that in terms of like, are the money going to these health causes to COVID? And obviously we found out that like, the CDC has been cut out of the information uh, channel from hospitals now. Like hospitals have been told not to report information to the CDC. They're being told to report it to the HHS and to Teletracker, which is a company run by a huge Trump donor. Like there is money in every disaster and there is money in every, yeah. mm -hmm. um, in every freak out. And the people who can foresee that by encouraging those disasters will make money from it and be reap those benefits. And so like, I think, you know, on a human level, it's so important to say like, wear a mask. Yes, like support your neighbors in your community. But on like a, there's a whole other level of people who don't live on a human to human plane who are taking advantage of the situation and they are also causing this catastrophe. And I want to, just to clarify what I was saying, because I, I, yeah, I think that came out more, uh, I didn't mean that to be a specifically red blue uh, statement. Oh. Because I, I see people, tons of, I mean, I know people who are, you know, good liberal folks and stuff who also don't seem to get the ma mask thing. And I'm, I'm like, why are you letting your kid do that? Or like, or why, are you, what are you doing? What, you know, and so I, my, my, my comment about stupidity event was meant universally. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> you know, by the way, remember- but I, want, I just want to quickly say, Tom, hang Tom, on one Tom, second, Tom, Robert. Tom, I just want to say Tom. one quick thing. The uh, uh, believing that all sides are stupid, hallmark of this show. Robert, go ahead. <laughs> well, following up that, there is a similar, uh, and I, 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 I would be very interesting to see the data, the data on this about the overlap on 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 mask adoption, uh, the, the the cross ideological um, uh, numbers on mask adoption and uh, and um, vaccine skepticism, because I, I, I no because I, I I think there is a similarity that the uh, but um, I, I, I won't I won't out the person completely but uh, somebody in my somebody somebody in my family. Somebody in my in my ex extended family is one of those people who's smart in many many in kind of many in many many ways, but uh, to Rex's earlier point, has started to buy into some of these some of these conspiracy theories out there. Uh, there was a conspiracy theory that's going out, and it's and it's slightly more predominant, I think, in the black community than than broader that. That um, coronavirus uh, is actually—it's uh, this kind of—it's—it's it's a government plot that's connected to 5G and 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 this kind of and this kind of stuff. And I'm and I love this this person in my family, so I just kind of do the like nodding kind of thing and just try and gently push back without getting into a big fight. But when this person in the family then starts saying, "Well," I, I she then starts sounding more like somebody on the right who's like saying. Well, you know, uh, these people, th th these are some of the same people out there. They're pushing, they're pushing this, um, uh, a, vac a vaccine on us. And I have to start worrying about, w wondering about uh, w whether I should give my kids their, their booster vaccine shots. And I'm trying to think, 
whoa, we're going down a real, really kind of danger. Now, th this person in my family is, is uh, uh, wears, wears a mask, so which is a good thing. But I do see some overlap between those who hate, hate vaccines, whether it's a potential coronavirus vaccine or the vaccines that we have, and those who are saying, uh, you know, the, the, the government and the masks and, 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 it, and it, it hurts my breathing and all of this. There's, and again, these don't always, all, these don't always fall on, on pure ideological lines. Yeah. Robert, you're in luck because that family member of yours is waiting right in the hold room over <laughs> there right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but what, and I think let's, let's also, I think, I, I, I don't want to spend all day on this because there's a couple other things to talk about, but I do think, let's, going back on the mask issue, going back a few months, I think, to be fair, we got conflicting messages at first about masks. Yes, uh, there, absolutely. And because it's not a cure-all, you know, it's just, it helps limit it, it's a very personal choice thing. Now, a big part of why we got conflicting messages and people said, you know, that one big reason why many governments, you know, left, right, center, uh, warded away from masks is because we weren't sure that we'd have enough for healthcare workers and we didn't want to create a run on those masks. Uh, now, why the immediate response of every government wasn't, then we should pour a ton of money in all these mask companies is beyond me. But that was early on, there was pushback from the CDC, from, from Democrats and Republicans, you know, against everyone having masks, a big part of it, because they didn't want to create a national run on masks. Uh, and when you have that conflicting info, something Robert and I've talked about before, something you know that even Trump does, one, one thing that most Republicans do uh, that even Trump does is find that little, little, little nugget of truth that helps their argument and spin it into a whole thing. Uh, and he brought, he brought that up this week, you know, uh, on, I believe it was this Fox News interview, uh, where he said, first, Dr. Fauci says you don't need a mask. Now he does. And by the way, I'm for masks. Uh, you know, it's, Again, I, I always hate saying hate saying that because I always come off like the I always feel like it comes off like the principal saying to you know the kid who gets bullied around who punched back well you shouldn't you know like don't let this you know like it's letting the bully off the hook but that is you know he was given that ammunition to get away with it uh, but it is curious to me at this point we know it would make a difference I'm curious why people think uh, uh, you know this week uh, the press secretary uh, Kaylee. I don't care to remember the rest of her name. Um, Finders full of Dadaist Mad Libs. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> which I assume in that, my favorite thing about that binder was like, she, you know she's only filled out the tabs. That was just blank <laughs> paper in the rest of it. Uh, but you know, yeah. she said that the president uh, gets along very well with Dr. Fauci while his uh, Dan Scavino's communications manager was posting cartoons mocking Dr. Fauci on his Facebook wall. Uh, and while Peter Navarro, his his best pal there, wrote an op-ed basically saying all the many times that Fauci's been wrong, which, like, imagine being in government for that long and like, someone just releases, like, you're in the middle of a pandemic, your job is to help people get through, like, your entire, this moment in history is why your job exists. And then someone writes a USA Today article, it's just like, here's all the times this boner's been wrong, let's get him. Uh, like, that's got to be so discouraging. Uh, why doesn't President Trump just fire Fauci at this point? I'm concerned. I'm confused by this, which is not to say I don't think he should, but clearly he doesn't like him. Clearly he thinks he's wrong. Why, like, he clearly has no compunction about firing other people as he moved Brad Parscale around this week to a different role. Why is he still, like, why, why hold on to Fauci? I'm curious. Be because it, um, he... Uh, he doesn't want to, he wants to fire Fauci. He loved to fire Fauci. But the main reason why he liked to fire Fauci is the, is the same reason why he can't fire Fauci. And, and that's it, that, that Fauci is probably one of the best known uh, non-elected officials in government. Uh, he has uh, like a 75 or 78% approval rating with the public, uh, um, in in terms of handling handling this vi uh, this virus, um, Trump's is like in in the 30s, if 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 even that if even that high, and so he is envious of that polling number. But he knows that if he actually fired F Fauci, his own polling number would fall into the 20s or the teens or 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 what have you. So he's kind of he's basically he's basically stuck he's basically st stuck with him. And in fact. 
after uh, they, they they sent out these talking points, trashing Fauci and and you know Scavino puts his thing out, and Navarro uh, puts his USA Today thing out. It, they realize that the whole thing completely and totally backfires, and they rapidly put out these photos of of uh, Fauci meeting with Pence, and then um, and then Fauci meets with with uh, with Trump for the first time in two months. So I mean, they realize that um, that that Fauci is in is they they hate him and they love to get rid of him, but they literally they literally can't. I mean, and to your point, Robert. I think this ties back to our discussion earlier. There's this schism and people are confused because there is, there's lack of clarity. Like, do you listen to Fauci? Do you listen to Trump? Back, forth, back, forth. Like, there isn't a clear, like, this is what's going on. This is what you need to do for us to move forward. There's, it's all chaos. So the masses left to their own devices will come up with shit, will come up with reasons not to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And there are people to, uh, to a point brought up earlier, there are people who benefit from the chaos and they're making out like bandits right now, very sadly. Yeah, I think he got exactly what he wanted out of, um, he didn't, he doesn't need to fire Fauci, they, but they discredited him sort of like, and they're able to say, oh no, we didn't mean that, but that's enough. You know, it's like throwing, you know, a little red meat to the base to give them, like you were saying, Hannah, the, the you know, basically a, a, an ounce and it just sort of feeds the confusion and chaos. And if you don't want to believe Fauci, now you don't have to because you have all this stuff from Navarro and from Scavino and blah, blah, blah. And the president, as he always does, is able to play this sort of like, you know, deniability, like, you know, like plausible deniability. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Plausible deniability. Thank you. Yes, exactly. And, and I think. It's just nonsense. It's just, you know, it's just, it's a, they just do this constantly where they're just like, just kind of, it's like throwing smoke bombs all the time. So and that's what's been so hard, I think, about this administration for the media and for everybody else is that it's just, you know, it's chaos constantly and it's almost impossible to kind of, it's like you want to put a lid over it for a second to get it, things figured out, but you can't because it just keeps going and, 30 different directions and there's new bullshit popping up and it's just it's insane i think it is true too that it is harder it is harder for this administration even if they want to to fire legacy republicans like it's harder for them to fire people who've been who've served under under republican under the bushes either bush um not impossible but harder because they're still trying to hold they're still trying to hold on to the threads of those like non-extremist Republicans who voted for, you know, Bush Sr., Bush Jr. And if you get rid of these guys who served under their, under their administrations, then, you know, you're sort of telling those folks that they're, that they were never right, which uh, nobody likes to hear, especially. The, the Fauci, yeah, Fauci, <laughs> Fauci wasn't even that. I mean, yeah, Fauci don't. has been a, a completely, you know, non, non-partisan public servant for 40, you know, for 40 years. I, you're right, he was first identified by- um, yeah. then, Sorry, then I, don't, I don't mean then, his affiliation. Yeah. I mean, like, he served under, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, so, so I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's I, I will say this, and, and we, we, we had this discussion, I think, a few weeks ago on, on, on the show, that um, the, the the biggest mistake that the public that the the, that the public experts uh, and I including Fauci in this made was early on back in March when th th their statement about the public not wearing masks, which was yes, it was to try and minimize a rush on the masks. It wasn't but, just that though. Yeah. Yeah, but if they had if yeah if they had if they had been more nuanced in that and said. Uh, you know, N95 masks, uh, um, you know, the professionals need that, but otherwise any, any face covering that somebody can put on would be, you know, would be, would, would be beneficial. We have no idea because we can't do counterfactuals. We don't know how many more lives that could have saved, but if they had done that early, if they had done that early on, maybe even before the, the messaging on social distancing and stuff like that, you know, we might have been in a, we might have been in a better place, but at least, I agree. At a minimum, I, I think it would be different. Sorry, Julie. It's also impossible. To, it's impossible to know like what kind of disaster that could have led to, too, or if the long term effects of this disaster of not of people not wearing enough masks would have been in if the flip of this would have been worse. I mean, you know, we all have stories. Like, I have a friend who's an ICU ICU doctor who had to buy a mask 
on the black market on the street in New Jersey, like in the, at the height of, of, sir, you know, at the height, like in March, April. And can you imagine all the people who are saying it's their right not to wear masks now? Can you imagine what those people would have been like if we had said you need to wear a mask in March? Those people would have run to the run to the stores and scooped up every single thing the way that they did. At, at gunpoint. At gunpoint. At gunpoint. Yeah. yeah they, they really. Truly. And like imagine have... imagine that in a world where the government was like, actually, we had to buy a whole bunch of them for the hospitals. <laughs> <laughs> in a world, in a world that would just yeah. be chaos. <laughs> you know, it's just chaos of a different kind. I don't even yeah. know. It's impossible to know if the effects would have been worse or the same. Or, no. Nah. Yeah, you're right, Julie. We have been too hard on the president. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Oh no. There you go. No, though. but you know, it's just. Uh, yeah, I, I, not hard on him, hard on him, the hard American on, reactions. This is a this is a a unprecedented moment. You know. In that um, an, unpre an unprecedented moment. Yeah, we've well. never dealt with a pandemic hey, and I'm no president. That one, Robert. Well done. Well, well, what was that? Thank you. Thank I said you. I co signed that pun. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. that up nicely for you. Huh? Yeah. I really get why you've made it with both the Post and the Daily News at this point. <laughs> like, one day I want to see like the, the, the Michael Jordan documentary of your pun day. <laughs> you're just like looking at at ipads where other editorial columnists were like he can't pun and you're like i took that personally and, <laughs> uh and that's uh we'll turn it to one last issue and then we'll call it a day and just very quickly as we you know uh, we're recording this on saturday late friday night uh word broke that uh congressman john lewis civil rights icon uh, a real life superhero passed away uh in the past, we were doing recommendations uh, of things for people to do while they're inside. So, uh, I, you know, our, our lowercase recommendation today, if you have a chance, or just go to a bookstore, a uh, comic book store, wherever, pick up uh, March volumes one through three, which is uh, his, his memoir as a graphic novel. Uh, and I just want to quickly say, someone who used to work, you know, there's a lot of great things to say about John Lewis. I used to work in the comic book industry for about a decade. And I remember it meant a lot to us at the time and still does it not only did he choose to tell his story but he chose our medium to tell his story and it really I think spoke to a man who not only knew the importance of his story but knew the importance of making sure he could connect with a different audience than the audiences that had always heard his story than a younger audience and and I thought I always thought it was really cool like I can't imagine any other elected official saying let's do the graphic novel version of this story I'd imagine yeah, and it was it was not just a it's not just a compelling story, but it was such a, a testament to him that he would try and find a way to reach younger readers and 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 different readers. Uh, well, Robert, well, go ahead. just one quick thing in there. Um, I, I watched it last night because I I I'd gone out to dinner with some fr some friends. And I got home like around ten, ten o'clock or so, and then I, the news had broken, and I thought, oh my god, how awful! And MSNBC was running the, had run this documentary that they had put together about a, a year year and a half ago, uh, about a year ago called called Headliners, and and it was focusing on focusing on John Lewis, and and when it got to the point about how he had been inspired to, 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 to do March, uh, the, 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 graphic, the graphic novel, uh, he said that one of the, you know, he'd been arrested 40 or 45 times during, during the civil rights movement. And, one, and at least one of the times that he was, he, was, he, was, he was in there, he was in there with a whole lot of young, young people, male and female. And um, in, in 1961 and 1962, Somebody had, had 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 made a comic book about um, Martin Luther King and the Montgomery bus um, bus boycott, and he said he was amazed. And they, they, back then, of course, the comic books were you know, ten cents, twelve cents, and he said he was amazed how many of his fellow fellow prisoners, um, um, his civil rights, you know, freedom rider prisoners, had that. Had that comic book on them because they they, they had a they had a sense that they were going to arrest get arrested and they figured oh well you know I may as well have, I may as well have something to read while I'm you know while I'm behind bars and he was surprised how many of them ha had it so when um, when um, the, the co-writer comes to him and asks about this he's, that memory 
came to him and he said, "Oh, what a you know what a great way to um, uh, to to reach a to reach a new generation." And and sure enough, you know he he um, the the first volume be becomes this huge hit, and he uh, he signs he signs copies at uh, at, at at Comic Con, uh, and uh, and getting into the spirit of Comic Con, he cosplays as his own younger self. Going across the uh, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I mean, it's I mean, somebody. He was you know he was the youngest he was the youngest person to speak at the March on Washington in 1963, and and in his 70s at Comic Con, he still manages to be the young person you know um, clicking clicking with them um, you know with younger with, with a whole younger generation. It's just like it's like really beautiful. I'd like to add the comic book industry. That's always you know the entire goal was give people in jail something to read. Um, uh, other thoughts on John Lewis uh, uh, from, from the panel? Well, one of the great ones has, has passed and it's incredibly sad, but also to look back on his life and how he chose to live it and um, to be a trusted servant and, you know, put himself in bodily harm when he was a younger man, but still stay committed through the, to the cause through the end of his life. Who, who lives that way anymore? It's incredibly inspiring. Um, and the other thing I was sitting and thinking as you were speaking, Robert, is like uh, he's crossed to the other side and imagining him with King, reunited with King. And we are standing on a pivotal moment in, in history, a moment where if we choose to, if we collectively choose to, we can make progress, so, like progress. Uh, but that doesn't come without us standing on the backs of our ancestors and people who have dedicated their life to, um, to making change possible and to realizing that dream or that vision. Yeah, I, and, and it's beautifully said, and I, it brings tears to my eyes thinking about that. Yeah, but, but um, I think too, I was having, I was thinking about it this morning about like why, you know, we've lost a lot of like really great people this year, last year, and like why, and he was 80 years old. He was 80 years old. You know, why is this especially resonant? And I think part of it is just the fact that he was so active up until like the moment he passed. Yeah. It was, out on this, out in D.C. with Muriel Bowser standing in front of the Black Lives Matter mural, he was, you know, on the floor of Congress in December, resurrecting the Voting Rights Act. Like the the idea that he was doing these things up until his final breath with such passion and conviction and, and humanity and humility is just, oh God, <laughs> it's a very sad day. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't say. Um anything more perfectly than you all have said, especially in terms of, of everything that he uh, did for civil rights and, and stood for as well. I think, you know, if you, you can't separate him from any of that, but, but the thing about him as a, as a human being uh, was just his decency. Mm. And right now, I think we have such a, a vacuum of decency. <laughs> we have such a lack of decency uh obviously from from the president um and his entire administration but but really from just a lot of you know a lot of people right now and i'll even caveat some of that to to both sides of the aisle to, to a degree uh, uh but I, you know so i think that you know we're at a pivotal moment in, in terms of making progress on on race and on on issues of, of still of civil rights and and, uh, and and I agree with that completely. I think in some ways our country is also at a pivotal moment in terms of decency and in terms of trying to regain that sense of of that a person like him is a, is a, that is a person you look up to. That is an ideal that we want to ourselves to strive for, that we want our kids to strive for. And um, whether we agree with that person or not, you know, but that's a good person, you know, and that's a good way to be. And you don't have to be an ass to, to you know, be elevated like that. So, yeah, okay. yeah. You, yeah, if I could just say, just two, 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 I know we're running out of time, just two, two, two other quick points. Uh, number one is, uh, it's amazing that in, in, um, in 1963, uh, he was seen as, he was seen as the radical amongst the big six of the civil rights organizers that put, that put the march together. And in fact, 
um, MLK and the other elder uh, uh, elder leaders had to go to him, and there were these back and forth rewrites of, of his speech because they he at, well, at one version of one version of it he says you know uh, if if we're not listened to here we will soon be we'll be marching elsewhere we'll be marching into Georgia like Sherman did nonviolently I mean that's exactly how he would written written and they said whoa whoa you can't use that and so they <laughs> so they changed they they changed they changed the language and a uh, a, a historian at, at, at CUNY actually did, did a Twitter thread, which I, I put on my Facebook and, and my own Twitter feed, um, going through all the changes of, 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 of his of, of his speech, which was still which was still remarkable even at the uh, even at the even at the end. And the other part part was, and this kind of speaks to Rex about what Rex said about about decency. Um, one of the more inspiring bipartisan uh, the things of the last twenty years uh, involved John Lewis and the creation of the uh, African American Museum. Uh, he 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 came in he, he came into office in eighty seven and I think it was in eighty eight or eighty nine and he said you know um, why don't we have a, a, a national um, African American museum on the on, on the on the mall so he started introducing it at that at that point um, it took another ten or twelve years when until a very very conservative. Republican Senator Sam Brownback from Kansas, and you know we can talk about. But he 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 literally said that um, he had been praying about these issues of racial reconciliation and so forth, and this thought had come to him of of a of a muse, of a museum of that nature, and then he realized that um, that John Lewis had 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 been introducing this over the over the, over the years, and he said he said well. John Lewis, he seems kind of out there, but then more I got to know him, I realized, you know, what a special, what a special human being he was. So, so he, and then I think also, I think he also brought Rick Santorum also, who was in the Senate at the same time, and they all, they co-sponsored it, and, and um, uh, a President, you know, President Bush um, signed it, you know, signed it into law in either 2003, 2004, and it was, you know, finally, it was finally built um, in 2016, I guess. So, I mean, that was, uh, you know, it's a testament to um, Lewis's vision and the fact that somebody like Lewis can inspire um, those completely on the other side on a whole host of other issues to do the right thing and, and rise to, um, to, to the moment of history. I think going, I'm just gonna jumping off that point, it also speaks to something that, and I think this ties in a little bit with what you're talking about there, Rex, it's just that, uh, there aren't enough people in government who are able to say, like, I, you know, I am not compromising my beliefs if I'm working with someone I disagree with, if the end cause is right, you know, uh, it's, that's how it works. Like we do, like, our system is far from perfect. The reason, you know, I, the best description I've ever heard of Congress and our government and the whole process is like, this is, and politics in general, is this is what we do instead of war, you know, uh, um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, for, for good and ill, like it's you know it, it's okay to work with people who you otherwise would not work with if the end cause is something that will do real good. And I think also on the other side of his persona and who he was and, and what he presented. And again, to your point, Rex, uh, he's a person who demonstrate. I think people often confuse the idea of decency with not rocking the boat and not making a scene and not doing things that will be controversial. He proved you could be a decent person and still boycott Donald Trump's inauguration. You know, you sure. can be a decent. He and in fact, like that might be the right thing to do, you know, mm -hmm. and even if you didn't think it was the right thing to do, you can't, you know, you can't question his decency. Uh, you know, and, and I think it, it, he, he was an example to people that like, you know, you use your strength wisely and use it for the right cause and, and, you know, trust that and, 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 you know, Hopefully the, the outcome will be right. Uh, With it's, integrity, it's like yeah, you can't nobody can come for you. Nobody could come for him because he was who he was consistently. Yeah, like and that's integrity for you. And that's what we're so um, hungry and thirsty for is like integrity and leadership. He, he he couldn't be he couldn't fear he couldn't fear what could be done politically to him because he he literally he had literally faced death a number of times <laughs> um, you know uh, in the face of dogs and water hoses and uh, and and goodness knows what else uh, so yeah he, he 
that that, uh, that that stiffens your spine and gives you a uh, you know a realization that um, uh, yeah it, it gives you a realization that uh, you, you can you you this too shall pass. So there's a lot of this too shall pass, and uh, and he, he can stay true to himself. I think that's that is a perfect place to to call the day for this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you, Julie Sharbet. Oh, uh, my pleasure. Love you, you. Love you guys. You as well. Good day. <laughs> thank you very much, Rex, for being with us. Yeah, it was so great to meet you all. I really appreciate uh, you letting me hang out. Great to have you here as well and to meet you in person. My, Thanks my, for my all the retweets. My corporate kinsman. Um, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for being here. My pleasure. Wonderful. And thank you. I'm sorry, I don't have to do that. I got a delay on this end, so I get uh, <laughs> And thank you, Robert George. Uh, thank you, John Brennan. And also a quick thank you to Kevin Scott for our show animation. Thank you to Joanne Harris for our show theme song. Thank you very much to Declan Shalvey and Jordi Belair. Uh, for the show's eagle art, and thank you to Ned Thorne for helping me uh, package these together every week. And now, uh, our musical guest on this week's show, we're going to be throwing things over uh, to the man who started our musical guest series down in Brooklyn, to our old pal David Frazier, who's going to play us out with one of my favorite songs on the marimba, Ned Thorne. Star wipe us over to David. Hello, all you electoral dysfunction fans. Uh, hey, Tom. It's great to see you again. Uh, I hope everyone is well, and thanks again for having me back on the show as a musical guest. And I'm going to perform for you a cover of uh, a song that I really like from one of my favorite bands called Coldplay. And this is a, a, a marimba cover of the song Viva La Vida. I uh, hope you like it. <laughs> Thank you. 